They say that Nashville is a 10-year town. It takes 10 years to be discovered and get your shot. There's many ways to connect a decade's worth of dots, and no two journeys are the same. But these are the stories of those who moved to Nashville and made it happen. This is 10-Year Town. What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. My guest today is my dear friend, Mark Beeson. Mark has written songs for some of your favorite artists, including Blake Shelton, Billy Currington, Martina McBride, and is perhaps best known for pinning the massive crossover hit, When She Cries by Restless Heart, one of my favorite songs. Mark has been writing hit songs in Nashville for over 30 years and has seen music grow through all its cycles and changes. He knows what it takes to build a career here and how to make that career last. He's been a great mentor to me, and I always find that his advice helps me focus on the parts of the songwriter's journey that are truly lasting. And now he's on the pod to bring that perspective to you. Please welcome Mark Beeson. Thank you for being here. Welcome to 10 Year Town. And uh, we start this thing out by by asking you, how, how long have you been in town, Mark Beeson? More than 10 years. More than 10 years. I've been in here since uh, 1990. Okay, because you grew up in Illinois, I want to say. Yeah, I was I was born there and raised in a small farm town there. Okay, until uh, I was 16, <clears throat> and my family moved to New Mexico. Oh wow, which was a big change. I mean, I always knew I wanted to do music, but mm-hmm. but I uh, I didn't. You know, it was a long time ago. So it was I mean, when I got out of high school, it was. 1973. So, <laughs> you guys, you're—I don't even know. Maybe your parents were maybe born then. I don't know. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I just didn't go to college. Okay. When I got out of high school, I just decided the only way I was going to be able to figure out the music thing. And back then, the whole music school thing, there was no Belmonts. There was nothing, right. nothing like that. No alternative for me in that regard. So where you could kind of get your arms around what the music business was. Mm -hmm. I mean, the music business to me was the albums that I read, you know, the liner notes on and and the CDs or whatever, cassettes. And, and, oh, that was way, that was way uh, pre-CDs. That was definitely in, cassettes were the cutting edge thing. Okay. It was cassettes. Yeah. Up till then it was all vinyl. How many songs were, could they fit on a cassette? I don't even know. Um, you know, it wasn't that much different than later records. Usually it would be like 12 songs okay. or something like that. Gotcha. And uh, uh, I think they could get more on that. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I started playing in bands. Was this, were you school. in New Mexico or? Yeah. Okay, so in, still in, in New Mexico. Mexico. And then I, I started doing some uh, running around when I got, you know, I learned, you know, cover songs, all that yeah. that junk. And uh Played in all different kinds of bands and, you know, solo things, you know, happy hour things at Ramada Inns and Holiday <laughs> Inns and that kind yeah. of thing for some, in some pretty depressing situations, you know, where I don't... A rite I, of passage. Well, yeah. And I mean, I did that for about five years and honestly, I there were times, you know, and I'd be sitting there playing in a, in a ramada inn bar or something and Mm -hmm. there'd be like three people in there and they'd all be drunk or something and you're playing some cheesy cover song and i I never felt farther away from the music business than than in those moments then then at some point you have to decide that it's you know at one point it's brave to go out and do that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and then you realize you know i i had this vague idea that the best people were in these other places like Los Angeles and Nashville, and mm-hmm. and I didn't really understand uh, Nashville at that time. I still was thinking that it was, uh, there were some country things that I liked, but I was still kind of under the impression that it was kind of hay bales and, yeah, you know. The, that, the country tropes. Yeah, and and uh, I didn't really understand, and, uh, and I was very influenced by a lot of um, Southern California country rock type stuff when I was in, in my teens, and... So I went to L.A. and um, 
I just decided I got to go somewhere and just find out if I'm good enough. Yeah. I didn't, I did, I didn't think that like being in the best band in Albuquerque or something was like the, the ticket and all be all. I couldn't get anybody to go with me. To, to move with Nobody you? Nobody would you, go. I had to go by myself. Did and, you um, just uh, like load load up the truck or, yeah, or whatever? I just loaded up the, the car and, and I, I drove to LA. I didn't even know what exit to get off of. Where'd I you just, go? I just, I ended up uh, taking La Cienega, which just happened wow. to like dead end at sunset yeah. in Beverly Hills. Absolutely. I had no idea. I could have ended up in East LA. <laughs> I did not know. Well, that was and, uh, that was just fate guiding. You. I guess, I yeah. guess, and uh, and then you know, kind of long story short is the you know your plans. I mean, I I was I played electric and stuff, and I played in rock bands and country bands, and all this kind of stuff. But when I went out there, I just took my acoustic because I was still thinking about Jackson Brown and Poco and the Eagles mm-hmm. and people like that, and and but I missed my window because I got there and and I remember. Uh, I stayed in this really, really shitty hotel for like a week yeah. just so that I could get my bearings and just wandered around, drove around stuff. Anyway, I think the second night I was there, I, I walked out onto Sunset and I walked down the street and the Whiskey Go-Go was right there on mm-hmm. the corner. And I went in there and Van Halen was playing. And uh, were they Van Halen or were they? They had just become just become Van Halen. Okay. They weren't giant yet, yeah. but they had just. I think they just had their first thing was really happening. But they were in their plan, and uh, and I, it was just like this rude awakening for me. I suddenly realized, man. I mean, these guys, you know, they're they're winning. They're wearing, you know. Spandex and flying flying V's and leather and and you know permed hair and everything and I just thought oh my god I'm a 22 year old <laughs> antique already I just walked in here and I I walked around that town for 10 years and and uh, you know carrying an acoustic guitar around in L A in the 80s I might as well have been carrying a tuba yeah I mean it was nobody was playing acoustic guitar during that decade there I completely was off. With that, yeah, I did learn a lot. I wrote a lot. I met a lot of people, and I met several people that ended up kind of steering me towards Nashville. Was there like a like a co writing scene in Los Angeles, like there is here now? And I, 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 you know, I'm there was co writing and that type of thing, but definitely not the community culture that we have here. Mm. And. Basically, it's not because there weren't really talented people. They're just spread out all over the place. Yeah. So the concept of co-writing, it's like a, you know, you'd have to pack an overnight bag to get to somebody's house to write. <laughs> I mean, it's, the traffic was so horrendous and the distances were so much farther. Yeah. Let- so even just going from Hollywood to the Valley could take you 45 minutes or an hour. And, and so there was kind of no way to really meet those people. Yeah. There yeah. was no central area where everybody went to and wrote. No red door or... N- well, I mean, th- there were, but in different places. Yeah. Like the Valley had a couple of clubs, Hollywood, West Hollywood, you know. And then even farther south, there's the South Bay, that was a whole scene, and Orange County was a whole scene. But they were like different worlds. Yeah. And so there was never a sense of community in that sense. I and, see. And it wasn't until I came to Nashville that I really really thought, wow, this is unbelievable. What was that your... community feeling. Yeah. Well, so so you're in LA, you said, what, for like 10 years? Mm-hmm. What was it that finally got you to pack up all your stuff and come to Nashville? Well, I had, uh, I had been doing little Tascam recording demos yeah. in my little closet. And, uh, and my... My then wife got pregnant and suddenly, you know, we had actually, both of us had uh, publishing deals at 20th Century Fox, but it was like, I was getting 200 a week. She was getting a hundred dollars a week. And <clears throat> so we were scraping by yeah. with no benefits, no, none of that kind of stuff, no mm-hmm. medical, no life, no nothing. So she got pregnant and I had hit kind of a wall and trying to manufacture something to work, go my way, you know, 
you know, they're just, like I said, I'm playing yeah. tuba solos, you know, in right. an electric, that's basically what it felt like. And, and so I just, I thought, I gotta get a, I've gotta get a real job. Mm. And so I started working uh, at, uh, I started working at Marriott in uh, Torrance. I had no experience at all. And I just, they were just opening this hotel and I went down there and the guy liked me and uh, I ended up being a restaurant manager. And uh, I was doing that for several years and writing on the side. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet some folks um, through a, a uh, an ASCAP songwriter workshop that I had gone to. And I met my wife in that class. I mean, Diane Warren was in that class. Wow. And uh, several other guys who ended up doing some stuff were in that class too. And um, we would have publishers would come in and visit. And there was one guy who had come, who had spent a lot of time in Nashville. And um, his name was uh, Ken Vassie. And Ken would come and he kind of liked what I was doing. So I would go play him songs. And he had an office at... Uh, at Kenny Rogers recording studio there. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. it. Is this in it? This is in LA. In LA, yeah. How would you, when you say show them songs, would you like show them a, would you like make a four track cassette? Yeah. My or? little, yeah, it would be like my little that, or I would just go in with a guitar and play them stuff, whatever. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> and I, I had met this guy, uh, I had met this guy who lived in Malibu and he had figured out a way to to link up two two of them, mm -hmm. so you get eight tracks. And I had written a couple songs uh, with Joni, uh, and they were good, but I didn't know how to I didn't know how to get it down. We had no budget to go do demos or whatever. Yeah. And anyway, I paid that. I remember I think I paid him like three hundred bucks, and we cut like three of the songs. And we used his drum machine and a couple of Les Pauls, and they really turned out really cool. Yeah. And I took them, I took them over to uh, Ken's office and uh, at, at the studio, at Kenny Rogers' studio. Now, in the '80s, Kenny Rogers was the biggest, was one of the biggest artists really in the world. Yeah. And that studio uh, was an incredible studio. They had three studios, three different rooms, and uh, uh, like I used to hang out in the coffee room sometimes just to meet the artists when they come through there. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, Barbara Streisand, Peter Cetera, Rod Stewart, and these people, they were all cutting their records there. And Michael O'Mardian was producing uh, all those, all that Peter Cetera stuff, you know, uh, and uh, and David Foster was, was doing like uh, that Broadway album for, uh, Barbara Streisand. I mean, wow. these people, like Yes was in one studio. Yeah. And I remember one night just going in and like looking at Steve Howe's guitar setup. I mean, he was like this guitar god. And there's like 10 different amps and all these guitars lined up. And it was just, it seemed so surreal to see that, that yeah. kind of a thing. Anyway, let me back up. So I took these in one day and I played them for Ken and he really flipped out. He said, holy shit, man, this is this is so cool. And yeah. we went in and saw, and saw another guy who worked there and they were, got really excited. And they said, we need to like do some, do some demos. And I said, okay. And this is, I'm working full time as a restaurant manager. So trying to figure out when we could do all this stuff. Yeah. It was, it was like moonlighting as a song. Yeah. And we had a baby and it was, it was really wacky. And, uh, and he had, they had the first, uh, Synclavier in town. What is that? The Synclavier was a keyboard with this computer set up in it. It was the first, it was the first, we did the first digital recording in Los Angeles. Wow. On a Synclavier. That's we awesome. literally did. And there was a guy that they knew who was a great keyboard player and he came in and knew how to operate it. We used a live drummer and I played, I played electric and acoustic. And then this guy played these keyboard the, this all this MIDI stuff that was that was new, yeah, and it was really amazing what they did, and um, so 
they tried to get me a, a pop deal, mm -hmm. and um, there was a little bit of interest, and then it just kind of fizzled out, and and Ken decided he was going to move back to Nashville, so um, that was all fine. And uh, one day, I'm working uh, at the restaurant, and it's the middle of this lunch, lunch rush, and this place is jammed. I'm in my I'm in a suit. And the cashier is waving at me, and I went over there, and uh, and I and I took the phone, and and it's just like crazy in the place, and I I said, yeah, and uh, she said, this is uh, Paige Levy. I'm A uh, and uh, for uh, Jim Ed Norman at Warner Brothers in Nashville, and we heard some stuff of yours, and I just wondered. If we flew you here, would you spend a week here and just like wow. if I set some rights up for you and that kind of stuff? And it was – I'm standing there on this restaurant floor. The place is jammed with people in my suit, and this woman's asking me to – and I said, yeah, I think I can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and uh, and I spent a week here. It was in November of 89, and she set up some some key rights for me with people that – had major influence on me. Yeah. And uh, and that, after that, I just remember calling Joni and just saying, I don't know about you, but I'm moving to Nashville. Yeah. I mean, it I gotta, was- I gotta get here. I couldn't believe it. Wow. I couldn't believe it. That's incredible. That is a truly like amazing story. That like sounds like a movie to me. It's long. It's yeah. just long. I'm sorry. There was kind of no way to edit some of that out. No, but. no, that's great. Um, So yeah, so you, you come here. How, like how long before- you know, you're here for a week and you'd pack up all your stuff and come here. How what how long did that take? Well, uh and she kept she kept telling me, now, this is no guarantee of anything. And I of said, course. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. You know, we're not paying you anything. I said, Okay, that's fine. I just took it as a sign that this is where we should be. Yeah. And uh and so we 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 had this little house that we bought, get this, for ninety nine thousand dollars. <laughs> and uh in LA. In LA. And it was uh down it's down near Palos Verdes and uh and we sold it because the deal we made to ourselves was okay, we gotta go there and I have to be able to just write at least as long as whatever we sell this house for lasts, yeah. you know. Sure. And we ended up making I think we ended up making like forty thousand dollars on that. Mm -hmm. So we came and uh, we moved. I mean, we moved down in a little uh, neighborhood in Franklin, and Aaron started going to public school down there. And it was that was that was great. And uh, Mark Bright and Tom Schuyler produced some sides on me for Warner Brothers, and Mark went on to produce. Uh, you know, at Rascal Flats yeah. and Carrie Underwood and those people, but he practiced on me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Tom was Tom's in the Hall of Fame now. He's a great songwriter, and uh, and that was an education in itself. Just working with those guys and figuring out where the bar is set. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, none of that stuff worked out with Warner Brothers. Uh, it's interesting because they. And and this could happen to anybody, but I remember we cut like the first four songs we cut. They said, you know, Jim Ed said to me, and he's a great guy, but he said, I don't think the songs are there. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. And then like within a couple of months, two of those songs got cut and one of them ended up being my first country single on other people. Yeah. And, uh, and I just thought, God, man, it's so weird because you kind of don't know who to believe. Yeah. You know, you believe one thing and then something else becomes true and you go, oh, wait, now I believe that. <laughs> right, right. It's just, and 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 that helped me figure out, you just have to decide what you believe in and stick with it. Mm -hmm. because, because you believe that those songs were, I, I, were there. I did. And you were proved right. It sounds like I did. But I did. But the thing is, you know, you come to in a new situation and everything's different and you, and you want to put maybe too much weight in what other people think, mm. at least for a while, because you don't want to appear to be arrogant or you're yeah. wrong or something. Oh, I, yeah. I couldn't have that kind of attitude in that situation. Uh, but it just, it was a great lesson yeah. in this business and how subjective it is. Yeah, it's incredibly subjective. Um, and you know, but so anyway, 
long story short, Mark ended up offering me a deal at EMI Publishing. And it took longer than I thought, but I was like... To, to get for, the, for to the close deal the to deal, get worked out? To close the deal. How long did yeah. it take? What's well, it ended time? up it ended up taking like it ended up taking four months or so, you know, and we had pretty much I thought agreed on everything. It took about four months. Yeah. And I remember when when I signed that deal, and the whole time I had to keep a straight face because I didn't want them to think I was sweating. But the day that I signed that deal, I had two hundred dollars left. <laughs> Of the forty grand, of the forty grand, because wow. it was, took like a year and a half for that to yeah. happen, and so I don't know. <laughs> it's weird, but man. hey, it worked out. Yeah, it worked out. It's yeah. kind of been working out ever since. Um, well, you know, it still goes. Everybody's it's it's a it's a roller coaster, it's man. A long winding road. Yeah. Um, how long had you been in town before this EMI publishing deal happened? Like, how long went from when you moved to Franklin and? Then that happened. Was it? Well, it took it took about a year and a half. Okay, and and uh, I was trying not to be too anxious, uh, and I knew Mark worked there. Yeah, and I met all the people that worked there, and they were such cool people. It was a great crew of people. Yeah, um, and getting signed there was a fantastic blessing for me because um, because the level of writers they had there, I think they had. Uh, maybe 20 writers then. And I, I would bet 10 of them are in the Hall of Fame now. Wow. I mean, Tom Schuyler, Richard Lee, Guy Clark. Yeah. Th- just these, they were giants. And I, I don't think I said three words the first six months I was there. <laughs> I just kind of walked down the halls and didn't say shit because yeah. I didn't want to piss anybody off because they were tough. Mm-hmm. They were really nice guys, but they were they were really tough. And they were pros. They were total pros. Yeah. And uh, man, um, something that you and I have talked about that blew my mind. I think one of the last times we wrote, you talked about, um, you know, nowadays when you have a write, uh, there's somebody that helps you with your calendar, so it just shows up in your phone, mm-hmm. um, and that's all I've ever known. But you told me that uh, it you used to have uh, was it a was it a date book or oh yeah a date timer. Okay, so yeah. how how did this work? Everybody had that. Well, you had to you were responsible for getting your own rights. Okay, so yeah. the so the that whole you part just, of the publisher job didn't exist. No, not really. I mean, they they would introduce you to people, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes they would, you know, it, like if inside your publishing company they could help you, you yeah, know, get on the- maybe you know give you contacts or whatever, and or might, somebody might call you and hey hey. Um, you want to write with blah, blah, blah on the 14th or whatever. Yeah. You'd say, yeah, or something. And, uh, but you had your own book. <laughs> it sounds so archaic, but I mean, there was, there was no internet. There was no email. Right. So there was no Google, Google cals. Everything yeah. was <laughs> write it down. And so you were responsible for your own schedule, your own calendar. And, wow. and, uh, and so, and I remember them taking, Taking me around, I know they did it with other new writers. Go, go around and and meet uh, meet some of the record people, some mm-hmm. of the producers, and they really encouraged me to to go out, make my own appointments, you know, take ownership of my career, be a self starter. Yeah, go out there and yeah. get some get some cuts, you know. Do and you, do you feel like that um, that attitude is still prevalent nowadays? Well, it is for me. Yeah, I mean, I I don't uh, I can't speak for other publishers. I don't think that uh, now I write at Smack. I don't think anybody over there minds me going out and doing your own pitching thing. stuff. And yeah. and you know, I think everybody, most publishing companies, I think have a pretty much of a team attitude. It's like heck, if the janitor gets a cut, hey, all right, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Just the way things that work are always fascinating to me. So the way that it used to work. I, when did that change from being, you know, all in your phone? It could, well, as soon as the internet started yeah. and the, you know, and emails and all that. And then, you know, and I don't know, I think, I think publishers kind of created that, mm. you know, and, you know, writers, writers, I, I still can't get over how 
inept a lot of writers are in, <laughs> in just like assuming personal responsibility for your freaking calendar or whatever. Yeah. It's like, come on. I know. It's an excuse. You know, turning a lot. in lyrics. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I still hear stories about, you know, from publishers, oh, yeah, well, you're one of the good ones. You actually turn in your lyrics. I'm thinking, there's people that don't turn their lyrics yeah, in. They're yeah. like waiting for somebody to listen and write. That. Oh, I don't know. So I don't really have that mindset. Yeah. So I'm, I guess I'm probably a little bit different. But, I mean, I think that it's important <laughs> to, like, recognize that, like, that is like, oh, it's a basic human skill. Like maybe we should have more of that. In I don't know. The writers here in Nashville, but I, mean, I know it's. I still, I still keep a book. At you home. do. I do. You write it down every I time. I do because I don't trust. I don't. I don't trust my phone one hundred percent. You know. I mean, I've got. It's my backup. It's yeah. my hard drive. I love it. <laughs> it's my original hard that. drive. I think that's it is. So I cool. just keep it. It helps me, but but mostly it helps me because so if I'm on the phone, I don't have to flip back and forth with the calendar yeah, on yeah. on my phone and flipping back and forth. I can just look. It's right there. Sure. I just can kind of go. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm open then. Whatever. Yeah. I can see a whole week or whatever. So, so what was your? Yeah. You know, I'm familiar with some of your biggest songs. Uh, and like, uh, like when she cries is like the, the, probably the first one that I'm the most familiar with, but like, what was, what was that your first like big, big success as a songwriter or was there, was there stuff before that? I had, uh, I had one hit before that. Okay. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, anywhere big as when she cries cause uh, when she cries crossed over yeah. into pop, but, uh, I had this song called Even Now, which was one of those songs from the Warner Brothers thing. Oh, that, wow. That uh, a band called Exile Cut. And they did a really great job on it. And uh, and they had a hit. It was one of the first one of the first singles on Arista when Arista started oh, in wow. Nashville. And uh, um, yeah. The other song that got cut, Martini McBride cut, it's called Phones Are Ringing All Over Town. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, it's on the Wild Angels record. Okay. And it took like two albums for her to decide to cut it. It was crazy. She had it on hold for the album before that. Uh huh. And then we never heard anything. So just thought it was over. And I found out the weirdest way because um, that album, that other album was over and, and she'd been cutting for Wild Angels for a while. And we never heard anything from them. And literally, somebody at EMI came up to me one day and they said, Beeson, did you know you've got a song on Martina's record? <laughs> none of us knew. Wow. Like none of us, she didn't tell anybody. It's just like the record came out and that's how we found out. Damn. And it was, that was, that was the, one of the craziest ways I found out I got a cut. The least stressful way I've ever found yeah, out. Yeah, that's- Oh, no nope. holds, no waiting, no, done. It's hey, there. bingo. Yeah. Third cut. <laughs> well, you kind of like- gave up on well i don't know if you gave up on it but it's like you didn't have to worry it was already it had already been not happening yeah and then it just happened, well you think so. it wasn't happening but yeah. like a lot of stuff in the music business you don't there's things that go on that you don't know about and mm -hmm. i really i still to this day believe that the most uh exciting things the best things that happen to you are the ones that you don't plan yeah. we have this you know we have this illusion of control and of course Really, the only thing we control is what happens in the room when we're writing. Yes. And then the song leaves that room, and then... That's it. That There is no more control. Yeah. You can direct something somewhere, but... You can send a song. You can send a song to somebody, mm -hmm. you know, but you can't make them cut it. No. <laughs> you can't tell as, them... As much as you want to. Yeah. As much as you, uh, in the group text, are saying, sending fire emojis or whatever, yeah. it's not going to make them cut it. Right, right, <laughs> right. Wow. So... When she cries, like it was a massive song, it crossed over into pop. Did that? Mm -hmm. um, when that was all happening, like, do you remember what was what was it like the first time you heard it, like on the radio? Do you remember that day? Well, I just remember, uh, I just remember Josh Leo, who produced it, took me out to his car during Fanfare. That that's CMA Fest now. CMA Fest yep. now, but Fanfare used to be held at the fairgrounds. Yeah, and they used to have two big stages and every day a different label would have would have all the stages oh, all, all wow. day okay so all week long it would be a different label every day 
but we could get pa- we would get the we would get uh, passes and they had this this big buffet thing set back back there with a big tent over it and alcohol for days and Open everybody bar. would just come there every day and just hang out backstage for, yeah. for every one of these for every show and you'd sit we would all sit behind the stage while the crowd's out there and uh, you know, they should bring that back. Hammered, I feel hammered like. just about hammered and full, <laughs> and it was a blast. And uh, and Josh Leo came up to me, um, and he said, he said, Beeson, you got to come with me, come with me. So I went with him out to his car, and he and he put it on in his car, and he cranked it, and I just thought, I thought. I thought it was really cool, but yeah. I thought they're never going to play this, man. This is way too pop for country. That's what I thought. Oh wow! And I had a couple things happen that made it seem like it was not going to. That yeah, they were going to put it out as a single. Well, okay. first of all, it was uh, you know uh, their lead singer had left the band. Restless Heart had, had left the band. Yeah. Right before that record, so the drummer sang that song, and he'd never sung lead. Yeah, so you just on any of their songs, and and you know, usually when like a lead singer leaves a band, the lead singer never really that never really happens. The band never really happens again. Yeah. And so you know, but the record sounded so good. I don't know. I just thought it was cool as hell, and and it came out, and uh, and I remember it got up into the, I don't know, somewhere in the. Around five or something. I don't know. Was so, this the so the single country. or the or the, the album the chart? Single, okay, the single and uh, and it got up to I don't know somewhere around uh, around five or something and um and I think they they were having some trouble with several country stations like that's too pop or mm-hmm. whatever and Joe Galanti was the head of RCA Records at the time and Joe was a legendary record guy yeah. in this town and. And with with huge sway, really, in the entire company. And he said, let's try this in another market. Hmm. And he crossed it over to pop, and it just took out off like crazy. Wow. And uh, it got to top five and the, the whatever, the top 200. Pop chart, or the, yeah. The, the pop chart. Double 200. And, uh, and then... Uh, and it got to number one AC, and and it was in the top five on AC for like fifty weeks. Wow! And uh, was that pretty life changing for you? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess from a financial standpoint, it was nice to be able to pay some damn bills without mm-hmm. you know that was that was. But also, I just remember feeling this 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 peace because I kept thinking about all of the shitty gigs I'd done for so many years and yeah. written these dang songs in hotel rooms and, you know, how many crummy songs I'd written till I wrote decent songs and then how many decent songs I wrote before I wrote anything good. All, all the time. Just thinking about all of that and, you know, that, that education that we get that you never get a degree for mm-hmm. that really never ends. No. If you want to, If you want to keep improving, if you want the adventure to continue, so to speak... You have to be willing to learn, and for me, that I'm, I'm digressing all over the place here. But, but for me, it's what keeps me going. What keeps me interested now, all these years later, is the same thing that kept me going then, and that is like writing with, with people like you. Mm. We've written some really cool stuff, yeah, which which I have to question why none of that has ever been released. But hey, that's okay. I, I'm going to put you mark. on spot. I know life is long. <laughs> well, longer for some than others, but. Uh, so that journey is continuing for me, but yeah. that was the that was what when when that song came out and when it when it did well, I just felt like God, man. I don't know. It just felt like it was well, really so, rough to get there, but I was so glad that I didn't quit. Yeah, I you love know? that, and and um, it's interesting to hear you say it that way because I've done a few of these with songwriters, and when you well, pretty much every songwriter I talk to, when I ask them what did it feel like. It's never like it felt awesome. I bought a boat or I bought a Rolex. To it's every single person so far has said I felt this immense sense of relief. 
Yeah. And it wasn't, it, I get the sense that it's not a, it's not a financial release. It's a, it's relief that, um, I, I, I'm trying to th- put myself in those shoes that it's not, it, it's a relief. Like it, it wasn't all a joke, you know, it wasn't all, yeah. it wasn't all a waste. Yeah. Um, because it is, it is hard. I mean, you're telling me that story, like I almost teared up a little bit, you talking about it because the journey is so, it is such a, it's such a hard journey, but it's so beautiful when it, when it comes true. And then it's also, um, you know, then that's, that's one. And then you get to go do it again. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you're just, um, I think that the, uh, the thing that you realize when you finally get there, and I, I remind young writers sometimes, uh, especially when I can sense that they're they're really intense. You know, there's like this intensity, like I gotta, I gotta, you know, I'm not gonna be happy, man. I'm gonna get that number one, or you know, you could just it's like written on their face, and mm-hmm. and uh, if if I feel comfortable enough, I'll say something like, you know, this is the ride, man. This is the ride. The journey because is the destination. When you get that number one, and if and if and and I've sat in rooms with people, and I confidently said it's going to happen. You know, nobody knows when, but it's going to happen. And when it does happen, it's not going to be the number one you're celebrating. It's going to be all the shit that you wrote that you had to go through mm-hmm. to get to that place. That's what you're going to be celebrating that you survived all that and all the songs that you wrote to get there. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I tell people I don't. I'm not a big streaming fan. So, like when I play, <laughs> like you know, if I'm in a round or something with an artist, and I, I, I mention something about their project, I was I always tell the audience, stream it if you want, but buy it if you love it. Yeah. Because you're not just paying for that song; you're paying for the 500 songs they wrote to get to that song. Yeah. And that's what makes it valuable. Yeah. That's and, what makes it good. Yeah. And so, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't mean to turn this into a real estate seminar. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's, uh, that's just part of this. You know, we're, I think that right now the music industry, I, I feel it, especially in Nashville, is at a little bit of an inflection point where we've got to figure out what we really value because there's a lot of money being made, um, but it's not, you know, I personally... Yeah. think it's unfair the way it's being divvied up and I'm doing my uh, I'm trying to do my part to I know include you are. the songwriters in in the I know the, you in are. The pie, and so I tell speak. I tell everybody about that and I I wish more artists uh felt the way you do Troy. I think I think they'll come around. I wish some of the labels would feel that way. Well, I mean the the uh, adapt or die, yeah. you know. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and uh, you know, I don't know if anything honestly I Ultimately, I'm optimistic about it. I don't know if it's going to happen for me, but I think in the next 10 years, there will be a dramatic change. I hope so. I, I, I truly believe that. I mean, it's too, what, what we do is too important to mm-hmm. all of it. It is. And, and people make, you know, there's people, it's non-creative people that are making decisions to, yeah. you know, to hoard, to hoard that. And, uh, but I think, Wiser minds will prevail. I think so too. I hope so. I, 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 uh, I believe in that future for for songwriters um, and creative people to to have that you know reality arrive, and I hope it does. But um, well, let's talk a little bit about. Let's touch on some other things that have kind of happened since when she cries. You know, you've had other cuts. Do any like what are some that that stick out to you as, as special ones along along this journey? Uh. Well, I mean, a couple of things happened for me uh, that were outside of country, um, like Chicago cut mm-hmm. one of my one of my songs, and uh, was on their second greatest hits record, and that was a, a that just like blew me away. Hearing a song with their horns and all this stuff yeah, on there it was so a, cool. an amazing cut. I, that that was because I used to listen to those guys like crazy. Terry Kath, the guitar player in that band. I mean, before he died, I mean, he was my inspiration as a guitar player. And uh, and Peter Cetera was in that band, and and he left the band and and did you know all that Karate Kid stuff, and you know, you're all my inspiration. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even remember that. anyway. And he cut a song of mine, and he flew me to Chicago and 
and I sang backgrounds with him on it. And and uh, I've done this demo where I played this little acoustic solo on there, and he said, I want you to play that on this record. So I, I played wow, it on his record. Play I mean, guitar, it was just really surreal to like be able to hear heroes do do doing something you were a part of creating yeah. and that was very significant to me um it, they were those it was it was past when they were giant but they were but you know both of them were like top 10 ac hits and i made some money off of it but the most important thing to me was they were still great records yeah and well, those were your was, heroes that you got yeah to. and and they and i just was knocked out they were still badasses and Peter Cetera, the dude was is one of the most incredible vocalists, and and uh, I mean he sang he sang the song a step and a half higher than I sang it on the demo, mm -hmm. and it was as high as I could possibly sing, <laughs> and he sang that, and then he had me sing backgrounds with him. We went out in the studio and. I'm singing the low part, and I've got a pretty strong voice. And he yeah. had me this close to the mic, almost this close like this. And he stood like 10 feet away. <laughs> His voice was so strong for us to blend. He stood <laughs> like 10 that. feet away, and he's singing, he's singing full voice. And it's like, it's like we were singing together. Oh, my god! I couldn't believe it. It was freak of nature stuff. I, I couldn't believe how powerful that guy's voice was. Wow. Unbelievable. That's incredible. We were talking before we started a little bit about um, you kind of mentoring some some songwriters that are just beginning their journey. Like, what do you what do you tell them? Um, you know, I I think the most value that I have for them uh, is just for them to ask questions. Okay. And not me. I I, I always I always tell them I I'm not a teacher. I don't have a class. I don't have a I don't have a bullet points to to run run by you. You know, I just want you to ask questions that nobody gives you the answers to. Because mm -hmm. I could, because I, I think about when I was eighteen, nineteen years old, I wished that I could have talked to somebody who would just level with me and tell me about what it is. What do you have to do? I don't think I would have been scared by how hard it is. I think it's very intimidating, not understanding how you can get yourself into it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of kids waste too much time thinking about like, well, who you know and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and I always tell them, it doesn't matter who you know if you can't go in the office and blow them away. Yeah. All that matters when you come to this town is try and be the best at whatever it is you're pursuing, singing or writing or whatever it is. Be great. Because once you get to stand alone some kind of a thing that's that sets you apart, they'll find you. Yeah. They'll find you. But there's no shortcuts and it's gonna be really hard. And you're gonna have really hard nights and nights where you go, what am I doing with my life? And you just go on. You just keep going. Yeah. And I don't know. I think maybe the there were times when I feel like the best thing that ever happened to me was I didn't go to college. I didn't have anything to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And there were there were times, I think, in my journey where if I had had a way to go back, I might have taken it. You think so? But I didn't. Cause, and so if you don't have any place to go back to, mm. if you don't have a bridge to go back over, you just have to keep going forward. Yeah. And well, I think that's what we do. Yeah. I think that's you what we do. Burn the boats, you know? You know? I remember yeah. I had this sort of like inflection point um, when I was, I hadn't even moved to Nashville yet, but I, 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 I was having one of those moments and it was like a month long of just like, what am I doing? And I went um, and I was like, I guess I'll apply to business school. I'll go get an MBA. And in order to do that, you had to take a test, uh, some sort of entrance, entrance exam to get a score. And uh, I, I went to the, the first class. It was like, you could do like a 10 week prep course. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the first class and I, 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 my phone rang and it was uh, this booking agent out of Austin. And he said, Troy, I wanna, I wanna book your shows. I just closed my book. 
and I got out and I never went back to the class. I never looked back, but, but, uh, and, and in the end, actually the booking agent, like it never materialized, <laughs> but it didn't matter because it got right. me out of the class. So well, it was, that's because this sign. is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. I do believe fate steps in. I think it does from time to time. Um, how do you, uh, how do you stay motivated now? I think you said to me, uh, last time we wrote something along the lines of, uh, your, your best song, you still believe your best song is, is in front of you. Yeah. Is that like your, is that what kind of gets you out of bed every morning is just the excitement to, to try and pull a rabbit out of a hat? Yeah. You know, it's a, that's a challenge and it's not any different of a challenge now than it was you know, 30 years ago, I still yeah. feel like it's a challenge and you want to get in the room and you want to, you want to be a part of a song that makes everybody, you know, go, holy shit. Yeah. You know? And best. I, I just remember the, I think the second month I was here, I went to the Bluebird one night and, uh, and it was Mike Reed and, uh, I think, I think it was Gary Burr, Beth Nielsen Chapman and somebody else. And I didn't, I didn't really recognize any of the songs, but by about the third time around, I, I had what I call my real legitimate holy shit moment where I realized I thought the bar was set here <laughs> and suddenly I realized the bar was set up here. And yeah. like every single song, every single song. And I thought, wow. And I, and I remember feeling like it was this combination of like, scared. Yeah. Cuz I thought it I think it's one I think it's something a moment that everybody has when they come here. And and I think that moment sends a lot of people around home to mama. Mm. Because it's you can't paint it over, you can't that's not something that you can you just got to you can fake. You it's the it truth in, when in you face. when you in your own heart you realize I am not nearly that good. Mm -hmm. And you decide, okay, I'm just going to have to bust my ass because I've got it. To, there's no shortcuts. You just yeah. start busting your ass and listen to what they're doing and learn from it, you know? And I remember going to uh, write with Robert Byrne the next day. And Robert was one of the guys that I wrote with when I first came to town. And Robert was ended up kind of being a mentor to me and maybe one of the best, greatest songwriters I ever had a chance to work with. And <clears throat> Robert was, I told him, about what happened the night before. And he said, he said, well, man, he said, that's because you're scraping at capillaries and they're cutting down into the artery and they're bleeding all over the page. Wow. And that image always stuck me, stuck with me. It's like, God, you're either scraping at capillaries or you're cutting down to the artery and bleeding all over the that's page. Good. And I just felt like, okay, I got to start cutting deeper, man. Wow. And that's exactly what Robert did in his writing. And he was pretty matter of fact about, about how he felt about it. And I don't know. I think I would encourage young writers to be around people like that. Yeah. You know, be around people that are a lot people better around than people you. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. Be, that are a lot better. And that will, that will say things like that to you and, and own it. Yeah. I mean, if this is what you want to do, yeah. You know, you got to be told the truth. Yeah, um, and, like, and, and just face it. Yeah, it's like Alan Shamlin always says, "Hey, man, we're not fishing for bluegills, man. We're fishing for marlin. <laughs> and you don't catch marlin in the shallow end of the pool. You got to get in the deep oh, water, man. I love that. So you got to get out in the deep water. Yeah. Well, Mark Beeson, thank you so much for being here. Oh man, thanks for having me, yeah. Troy. It's good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. All right, that's it. That's the pod. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Ten Year Town. We're doing a Q&A episode at the end of the month, so if you have a question for us, go to tenyeartown.com and click on the Q&A button to submit your questions. We also drop new interview clips throughout the week on all our social channels, so follow Ten Year Town on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, etc. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple and Spotify Podcasts to get all new episodes every Tuesday. We'll see you next week.